Okay. Um, welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, this is the latest seminar in a series devoted to new scientific opportunities that will be enabled by the uh, ESRF Extremely Brilliant Source. And uh, this seminar series is supported by Streamline, and we have uh, one more seminar to go, but this is the last seminar that's going to happen uh, before the summer break here. Uh, so the next seminar will be in September. And uh, I thought I would start with just a few practical notes um, for uh, uh, anyone who has any questions. If you notice at the very bottom of the screen, there is a Q&A box. And if you have any questions during the course of the talk, please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A box. And furthermore, if you see questions that uh, you also would like to see answered, you can feel free to upvote those as well. Um, or maybe your question has already been asked. And uh, the voting will actually help us to prioritize which questions we are going to address first at the end. Um, so uh, please do uh, feel free to add the questions at any time. Uh, another thing to mention is that this is uh, simulcasted on YouTube as well, and uh, the entire talk will be available on YouTube uh, afterwards as well uh, for your review. Okay, so um, I think with that, I can start with the introduction of uh, Daniele. So Daniele De Sanctis is going to be giving us a, a talk today uh, on pushing the boundaries of MX at the EBS. And uh, Daniele uh, got his PhD in physics from the University of Genoa, uh, after which he did a, a postdoc at the ITQB in Portugal. And I think it's interesting to note that uh, during this entire time, he was a, a longtime user of, the, of ESRF. So he has a, a long history with the synchrotron. Um, and in fact, in 2008, he started as a beamline scientist here on uh, ID23 and ID29. So these are two beamlines that were uh, specialized for uh, term determining phases for macromolecular crystallography. And uh, if you don't know what macromolecular crystallography is, uh, luckily, Daniele is going to provide some introduction to that at first. Um, and uh, in addition to, all, to his, his role as a beamline scientist for 20, ID23 and ID29, he is now in charge of an ambitious new project uh, to build a new beamline where ID29 once was called EBSL8. And this beamline is going to be specialized on a, a new field uh, or um, relatively new field called serial crystallography. And one of the things that this new beamline is gonna allow us to do is to study time resolved. Um, crystallography. Um, and uh, so we're going to hear quite a lot about the, the exciting new uh, sample delivery and analysis methods that are going to come with this beamline. And with that, I give Daniela the floor and uh, I'm looking forward to this talk. Well, thank you, Max, for the nice introduction. Thank you all for joining today to this uh, webinar. So I'll give you a perspective of the future of macromolecular crystallography, especially with the new extremely brilliant source at the ESRF. Uh, I will start with an introduction of what is MX, uh, especially for those who are not experts in the field and are now listening today. I'll give you an idea of what has happened out with MX at the ESRF over the last 10, 15 years. And in particular, with uh, uh, giving relevance to the hardware and software development that has led MX to become a such successful technique uh, worldwide and at the SRF. And then I will step into the new characteristic of uh, the extremely available source, uh, highlighting the future of the MX uh, at, with the new source. And I'll give you uh, an introduction on uh, serial crystallography. And uh, finally, I will present the uh, project of the upgrade of ID29, which is where all the, um, the kind of science that will be enabled by the new EBS, uh, in particular in the field of serial crystallography, will try to, um, to finalize. I cannot move the slide, wait, okay. So uh, the, over the year, the setup of crystallography has become very much uh, standardized. 
And this has been also one of the key of the success uh, of, uh, uh, as a technique to solve the structure of macro and molecular uh, molecules. So the crystals are fished or harvest into a solid support and cryocooled uh, in liquid nitrogen. And during the data collection, while they are exposed to X-ray, are kept at a temperature of 100 Kelvin. And while the crystal rotates, diffraction intensity are uh, recorded. From this diffraction intensity, we can calculate the structure factor. And with the help of some tricks to determine experimental phases, we can then calculate the electron density map. And from that model, the electron density map to build an atomic uh, model. So having an atomic description of any kind of um, biological uh, molecule. Uh, there are many developments that have uh, contributed to the success of uh, MX. So if we start in a sort of uh, chronological order in term, uh, at least from what the perspective of each of the project um, that led to the structural dissemination of the protein, um, we start with improving and getting um, crystals. So there've been a lot of development in the protein production in the techniques to produce recombinant uh, protein. Then in terms of crystallogenesis, to, to um, be able to screen many other, uh, many different conditions by using robots and nano dispensers. So to use, increase the chance to find the crystallization condition by minimizing the amount of sample uh, which is used. And of course, one of them is uh, cryocooling that has permitted to um, extend the life of a crystal into the X-ray beam and to protect also them during transportation. Uh, on the beam line, uh, what has contributed is surely automation, both in terms of hardware and software. Robotics that has permitted to increase the throughput of the, uh, of the number of samples that are uh, mounted uh, to be measured. And uh, the detector technology, there's been a quantum leap since the arrival of pixel detector uh, technology and the control software and the other accessory software uh, pro of which also ESREF uh, plays a big part in the development. So looking at the V-line from the user perspective, this is basically what the user would see. Um, we have a different meter here in the center, robot for the sample changer and the detector. As I was mentioning, the latest generation of the detector has uh, improved in terms of speed, in terms of minimizing the readout noise, and with the negligible readout time, which has allowed to, for example, um, introduce what now are, it's the standard, which is the shuttleless data collection. So the crystal is continuously rotating while the detector is acquiring basically a movie of the diffraction. In terms of diffractometer, and this has become also important, especially in the field of um, macro, um, macro focus uh, um, B line, the accuracy and the speed of the rotation end of the translation and the possibility of synchronizing multiple motor has allowed, the, has allowed to make uh, um, two dimensional mapping of the crystal and to exploit better uh, area of the crystal that diffracts with higher quality. And of course, last but not the least, the robot with the capability of mounting a sample uh, without any uh, human intervention, except by clicking on a software interface that has increased the capacity of the beam line and also the autonomy. Now you can fill a doer and have a beam line running for a day without uh, needing to get into the edge. For what concern um, software, as I was mentioning, and this is very much um, the layout of, uh, simplified layout of the software that are present on the um, BSREF as a part of a normal MX experiment. Uh, all the data and the samples, information of the samples and all the metadata of the data collection are stored in ISPB, which is a LIMS and a metadata catalog, which communicates with the software, uh, which is uh, uh, MSQ, which is a software to perform the actual data collection. And in between, we have some automatic pipelines to automate the uh, data analysis, but not only, also to be able to make sort of intelligent decision so that we can automate some of the process. And this is something that goes, for example, um, in complete use for the beeline that are completely um, automated, like a Massif 1 a BSREF. So the software decide where the crystals were to be collected to move to the next one and decide the kind of strategy that should be applied to uh, collect data on that crystal. 
in uh, some of these software are also part of a large collaboration. So for example, MSQ3, it's now uh, includes a collaboration uh, that includes a synchrotron across three different continents. So um, that's proved its success and user friendliness in the user community. And the latest version it runs on a web front end, which makes it uh, perfectly suitable for the future of remote experiments, especially in this uh, um, time of crisis that uh, um, will prevent users to come physically to the, uh, to the SREF. So all this development uh, uh, altogether has uh, allowed to exploit better the possibility of microbeam. So one thing that happened over the last uh, 10, 15 years, it was the increase of uh, demand of microbeam. Nowadays, we can collect data with microfocus beam line that few years ago, we could hardly imagine to be uh, on crystal, that few years ago, we could hardly imagine to be uh, measurable. And in this way, uh, not only be able to collect from them, but also to optimize the signal to noise by illuminating on the crystal part, the crystalline part of the sample. And in that way, uh, eventually collect data of higher quality. And then uh, also just uh, increase the, the throughput. So determine more structure, enable in this way, more study in terms of uh, fragment screening. So collect many, many crystals with different compounds uh, or fragments of the different compound soaked into the crystal. And uh, this kind of application is perfectly suitable, for example, for the B lines like massive one that are completely automated. So the users decide what kind of data collection they want to perform and the robot and the software takes care of everything without um, no human intervention. And of course, all together goes into the direction to provide a better structural information to better understand the biological mechanism, which is the ultimate goal of the science that we are doing. Uh, so if we look in terms of productivity, uh, the impact, uh, I would say that has been a uh, massive uh, accord in the last uh, 15 years, because you see here on the left side, the number of PDB, so unique structure or new structure that have been deposited in the protein data bank uh, from data that have been collected at the SREF. You see that over the year, uh, we are constantly above, uh, above 800, around 900 structure. Uh, deposited per year and this of course reflects also in the number of publication as you can see on uh, on this uh, uh, graph on the right uh, side among this uh, structure of course there are some very important highlights uh, so having to pick uh, some of them has been uh, uh, not easy so uh, I was going through the highlights over the mainly of the uh, last year just to provide some example of the contribution uh, that the MXB line has done to the biological uh, science. But uh, uh, as an example, we cannot, for example, forget the studies of the, on the ribosome that then they were awarded the Nobel Prize, or the study of a mechanism for repairing double strand DNA, or studies of uh, uh, the polymerase of the influenza virus, which are uh, very popular. So nowadays, because of the importance of the polymerase that has in, uh, um, in the COVID virus. Uh, other example of, of course, the GPCR structure, which were also awarded uh, a Nobel Prize, or this study of massive complexes like the crystal structure of the membrane part of the respiratory complex and of the entire respiratory uh, complex. But also smaller uh, studies of complexes like uh, this one, which is the, um, the, the, me the atomic mechanism of the gamete uh, recognition. Of course, this is just a tiny fraction of all the science that has been done at the SRF uh, across the, um, in the, in the latest years. Uh, clearly, nowadays, one of the greatest uh, challenges that all the uh, world is facing and all the MXB line worldwide are facing are the studies on the uh, proteins from COVID-19. Uh, this is, of course, a project that the SRF could join lately because we were commissioning the machine while the pandemic explodes worldwide. Uh, but it's important to note, to note how important it is to have such sort, uh, kind of facility in order to prompt react for, to a pandemic crisis like, um, like this one. So if you look to the COVID-19 data portal that's been set, set up by the uh, ABI, nowadays there are 260 proteins, uh, but all of them, among all of them, only seven are unique protein 
uh, over the uh, 27 proteins that are encoded by um, the coronavirus. And most of them are structured from the proteases, which is uh, uh, one of the main targets, uh, which is under study. So uh, clearly a lot has been done very quickly uh, worldwide, but still uh, there is a lot to do. And I'm sure that uh, EBS uh, and the SRF with the new machine will contribute in the future to this, uh, uh, to this fight against uh, this, this pandemic. So now moving uh, to ABS, uh, probably you have seen uh, a slide like this one uh, a few times in different uh, talk. Um, so the extreme abelian source, um, it provides a, re a great re reduction in the emittance, which is the, um, the product of the size of the source of the beam with, um, with its uh, uh, divergence. So if we look at different from the third generation, which is the old machine with the fourth generation, which is the new machine, you will see that the source size is more compared to what it was and the beam is uh, less divergent. So that means that for a unit of surface, we have more photons and in the end, uh, more photons in terms of uh, per, per time on the uh, sample that we are under study. So this all together brings to an increase in what is considered the, the brilliance of the, of the machine by a few order of, um, of magnitudes. So what is the impact on the DMX beam line that are currently uh, resuming their operation and in August, by the end of August, uh, they will restart in fuel um, user mode in a remote access, as I was mentioning at the beginning of, of the talk. So you see that for all of them with the minimal adaptation, they will have a gain in the flux. So the uh, useful photon flux that is gonna be delivered at the sample, while some of them they will, or they have updated uh, some of the hardware um, component. Uh, you see still also um, that we keep the idea of offering a portfolio of beeline that are best suitable for the different kind of experiment that the users would like to do. So we keep uh, an anomalous phasing uh, beeline like 23.1 and 30B. I think 23.2 that is gonna be stay focused on microfocus application and serial crystallography. Uh, and similar to uh, Massif 3, although with the slightly larger beam, but with, with the faster detector, and you will see what that might, um, might give as, a, as an advantage. Uh, while Massif 1 that I was mentioning before is designed for performing this mail-in and completely automated uh, data, data collection. Okay, so um, from what uh, I was mentioning, you see that uh, there is a great advantage in terms of uh, micro beam. So you've seen from the previous slide that the major, major gain in terms of photon flux is exactly for beeline like uh, 232 that can, can, can deliver at the sample um, the complete beam or almost a complete beam as it's uh, produced uh, by the source. With micro beam application, uh, we can if uh, working on multiple crystals on a, fi on a fixed support, identify easily where the single crystals are located or investigate the crystal viability inside the same crystal. Uh, in the future, we plan also to do, to be able to adapt the beam size. And you see here, you have a mapping of the different distribution of the crystal in this support from which is hardly to identify any uh, crystal. And we could identify by identifying the diffracting volume of each of the crystal or of each part uh, inside a crystal uh, by exposing with a dedicated and suitable data collection protocol. And uh, uh, eventually uh, after the data we analyze to be able to pull the most um, isomorphous data together by using a cluster analysis or a genetic algorithm, uh, for example. This one, uh, this kind of strategy has a double advantage of uh, being able to get higher quality data rather than combining all together, but only selected the data that are really isomorphous and in the end get higher quality data that could also be useful for different kinds of 
um, application like uh, also um, anomalous phasing or uh, analysis of ligand um, bounding. With uh, the advent also of higher flux and a faster detector, it is also possible to define uh, other kind of data collection protocols. Like for example, for the time resolved serial oscillation, uh, where data are collected for multiple crystals and then frames that are collected at the same time point are pulled together to assemble a data set. And we, in this way, monitor with time, uh, like in this case, the formation of a covalent bond, or like has been done here uh, in this study, which is and combine those with time and follow the radiation damage in uh, uh, this disulfide uh, bond. And the similar way as done in this uh, sequel of rastering, which is uh, very similar to, the, to this study, although this is done, not done with uh, um, oscillation, but by doing still uh, so rastering across uh, field, uh, solid support. Now, one thing that has changed in the last 10 years that has introduced quite a bit of new things was the advent of uh, serial femtocenter uh, crystallography. Uh, this was uh, exploited initially uh, with, um, about 10 years ago at the uh, free electron laser and consists in flowing a stream of microcrystal or nanocrystal across the X-ray beam. And every time that the X-ray beam hits a crystal, a diffraction image is, uh, is produced, uh, like the one that you can see here in, in this example. Given to the nature of the free electron laser radiation, uh, this has been considered for a very long radiation damage free data and has basically uh, opened to the possibilities to study crystals of even a smaller size, but most importantly at room temperature. So no cryoprotection is uh, um, needed, but instead, unlike in the classical crystallography, only one shot from each crystal is collected. And then all the diffraction images are pulled together to reconstruct the reciprocal space and eventually, as in conventional crystallography, calculated the electron density uh, map. Uh, due to the changes in uh, the data collection methods, of, there's been a lot, a lot of development in the protocol, in the software to analyze the data and to introduce them to new quality uh, indicator. The advantage of uh, collecting data at room temperature uh, is clearly um, very important. So it has been known for uh, quite a long time that uh, cryocrystallography can introduce some artifacts in the structure that we analyze. Uh, first of all, uh, um, cryocrystals, they have a higher degree of mosaicity, which is induced by the, approach, uh, by the process of cooling uh, the crystal. Uh, and moreover, uh, uh, the fact of cooling the crystal can decrease the, um, the conformational heter heterogeneity of the crystal uh, of a specific amino acid, like is, is shown in this, uh, in this work here, uh, that can uh, prevent uh, to observe the crystal, the protein structure in a functioning state. In this way, for example, for the study of ligand binding, we can end up also to prevent ligand for accessing uh, an active site because the protein at cryo temperature doesn't allow that to, to happen. And what is also important is, is to notice is that the thermal distribution at room temperature and at uh, 100 Kelvin is completely different. So this can hide the thermal, uh, um, can modify the thermal distribution and impact how a protein uh, behaves in uh, at room temperature or at the uh, um, cryo, cryo temperature. Clearly, since uh, uh, we have uh, the problem of radiation damage, uh, at especially at room temperature, serial crystallography is one of the best way to overcome uh, this problem. So collecting thousands of data set from thousands of crystals and then pulling all the data uh, together. The fact of working with hydrated crystals, so not cryocooled, and uh, more importantly, uh, microcrystal, 
has also an advantage because in this way, uh, ligand can be directly soaked into the crystals. And there are a few works that uh, show this, like, uh, for example, the structural changes due to the riboswitch, adenosine riboswitch, or like in this work from uh, in which uh, the flow of crystals is, is stream inside, while outside uh, the substrate is added. So reaction is occurring before the crystal exits the nozzle and the structure that is determined is the structure which is complexed with the, uh, with the substrate. And there are different way of uh, doing that. There, are, there, are, there is a lot of development in a different way of developing new injector and new mixing uh, system to, uh, to induce this kind of reaction. And the other uh, advantage of working at the temperature is of course that this is possible to do time reversal study because uh, the crystal structure are not frozen in a conformation as they would be at 100 Kelvin. So this has been done on the PYP protein, but also in a, to uh, observe the isomerization of uh, uh, the retinol at the free electron laser uh, in bacterial robicine or the uh, molecular movie of bacterial robicine. Uh, Clearly, free electron laser also allows, due to the very short uh, exposure time, to sample um, structural changes that occur to, in a very short uh, time scale on the picosecond or microsecond uh, time scales. Uh, at third generation synchrotron, this kind of experiment was somehow limited to uh, low diffraction, lower diffraction. Uh, now, crystal uh, crystallography. Uh, permits to do this kind of experiment uh, by using a different approach, exactly by combining uh, data from a thousand of crystals. Um, since the experimental setup is so much different from the one from uh, uh, MX, there have been in parallel a really massive uh, development of uh, um, sample delivery tools. So what you see here on the left are the GDVN uh, injector that were used at the very first uh, experiment done the free electron laser, uh, which has a very fast stream uh, that has also the consequence of having quite a huge uh, waste of sample, which is not intercepted by the X-ray beam. So in parallel to that, there's been also development to using uh, high viscosity injector, like this one here, that has a very uh, slow uh, flow rate so uh, it can maximize the chance of eating a crystal while doing the exposure and they've been specifically suitable uh, for doing LCP experiment because uh, uh, to study the protein, a membrane protein that crystallize directly in LCP that can be transferred on one of these injector and then extruded with um, um, extruded while collecting the data. And some of them, uh, especially also the high viscosity, they have been adapted, uh, especially for use at the synchrotron site, because since the sample flow is, is low, uh, they can easily measure at synchrotron site. So here you see an experiment that was done at uh, Massey 3 at the SRF. But there are also uh, other kind of develop, um, sample delivery system that uh, at synchrotron that was successful, like using uh, tapes. So the crystals are sitting on a tape while this is uh, unwinding and crystals are diffraction is collected or the use of uh, microfluidic. Uh, so here you cannot see very well, but uh, in this microfluidic support, there are different channels, one in which the crystals are flowing and one uh, with the, the substrate. And then at the T junction, uh, crystals see the substrate and it can be complicated. Um, injector could also be used to do some, some time result study at, uh, uh, at synchrotron, uh, like in this example here. But of course, uh, on a time scale, which is uh, uh, more suitable for um, free um, for third year electron synchrotron, which is on the millisecond uh, time range. Another very successful, a very interesting way to deliver microcrystal for serial crystallography experiment is the use of a uh, fixed target. There have been the very, uh, different development uh, in parallel. I'm just showing a few of them, uh, and it's, it's by far an exhaustive list of the development that has been uh, ongoing. But this is basically the concept. So uh, you, you have a chip with micro holes, like you see here, and the microcrystal 
because of some suction of light at the, from the bottom are sitting in each of the hole. And so we know exactly where each of the crystal is and we can uh, collect data, diffraction data from each of the uh, crystal which is sitting in uh, each of the hole. Uh, this kind of support seems probably less flexible uh, than uh, in injectors, but still they were successfully used uh, to do time resolve study by using a smart uh, approach, which I think it's called the hit uh, and return method. Well, they hit, they illuminate one of the well, and uh, then by playing with the delay, which is giving to the uh, time to the motor to unwind, uh, they can collect multiple time points uh, uh, from the different uh, vessel, or by using a, a nano or pico pipetting better uh, system just to um, add ligand of substrate to the crystal which are sitting on the fixed target uh, support. Okay, so now um, I'm going to show you how we are tr we try to convey all these uh, ideas uh, and uh, uh, to build a new kind of tools, which is the new uh, ID29, which is uh, uh, the project of BSL-8 um, that could better profit uh, from the new extreme abelian source. And at the same time, uh, to provide better, um, let's say, uh, to complete the structural information that we can get at the uh, time point at the time resolution, which is uh, in between what can be done with a free electron laser and what can be done at third generation uh, synchrotron. So more in the microsecond uh, time regime. So when uh, we designed the B line, we aimed for the B line with a very extremely high flux density. So completely profits from the ABSL with the time beam to be able to perform uh, time resolve experiment, but also to avoid to overheat the sample support. Uh, to be able to uh, synchronize the experiment time with the external event in order to do ex um, experiment with uh, a light excitable system or to uh, synchronize with, uh, for example, uh, uh, injector for uh, pipetting and adding ligand. Uh, have you seen how um, flexible are the sample environments that are used and are available for serial crystallography? I'm sure there is still a lot of development to be done and that will happen. So we need to have a very adaptable sample environment. But, uh, and we need to be able to record very accurate uh, intensities, but while keeping in a sort of uh, MX or DSRF or philosophy to facilitate the user community in accessing the data, processing the data and preparing um, and providing assistance in, for the sample preparation uh, on site. Uh, so again, for uh, the changes of uh, uh, for the 29 sources are uh, mainly due to the decrease, uh, as mentioned before, the, of, of the horizontal emittance, which is going to go down by uh, a factor of uh, 30. So this reflects by a gain of the useful flux with the uh, um, old configuration, as you were seeing that is happening for the other MXB line, but more than a factor of 10. Uh, of course, the old B line has complete, been completely dismantled. So, since we were building a, a brand new B line, we have investigated how we could fully profit and extend the capabilities of uh, uh, ABSL8 for this doing this uh, serial crystallography experiment. So, here what you see is the uh, the flux that you will have at 30 meter through a one by one millimeter slits, and what you see here it's in blue is the flux that we're going to have with the current ondulator source, uh, which is a U21 in vacuum. While for the near future, uh, we plan to upgrade that and replace it with one of the new uh, ondulator, which is under development of the SRF, this uh, permanently cryo-cooled um, ondulator, which is provide us with yet a bit of gain and flux and extend the range of energy at which the beam line uh, can operate. Uh, so as I said, we want a, very, a beam line with a very, very high flux density. So we want to focus down at the sample position, the highest, uh, all the photons uh, that are produced or most of the photons that are produced. 
so we are building uh, a long B line with a small uh, spot size of 0.5 by 0.6 uh, micro. Uh, here you see a ray tracing of uh, the beam spot at the at the sample position and the simulation. We still have are going to have um, certain divergence because of the magnification, but we have tested that with simulated the images, and this is perfectly acceptable even when working with very large um, uh, unit cell. And uh, uh, with this kind of source, the quality of the mirror is really the, the limiting factor from the uh, spot size that we are achieved. So we are using a KB system with a tremendously, um, tremendously low uh, slope error. Uh, but we still plan to be able to blow up the beam a bit to fit with a different sample delivery system uh, by tuning the angle of incidence on the, uh, on the KB system. Uh, since we wanted to maximize the photon color flux, we have uh, decided to go for a multi-layer uh, monochromator. You have an image on the, uh, on the previous slide, which will permit to have larger bandwidth. So we have decided to go for a band bandwidth between 0.3 and 0.4% and a bandwidth of 1%. Uh, this, as I said, uh, gave, uh, give us the double advantage of increasing the photon flux, so minimizing the exposure time and for time resolution experiment, uh, this reflects in the time point. Um, and uh, also at the advantage of thickening uh, the UL sphere. So as you see in, in this example, so when this is important when collecting refraction data from stills, means that since uh, uh, these crystals are stills during the collect, a lot of diffraction spot might be partial. By thickening, uh, thickening the UL sphere, we will have uh, data that will be more completed. So we, we should be able to get completed data set with less diffraction images uh, if, than if we were doing it with the lower, um, with the smaller bandwidth. Uh, for the timing, uh, we are developing uh, a double chopper uh, system. Uh, the first one, which is what's called heat load, and as the name says, it's intended to remove a lot of the heat because 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 photons per second in vacuum can produce a, a lot of heat. And a second chopper, which is, uh, which is a new project, uh, which is gonna do the actual uh, exposure time. And we wanted to have it, uh, both of them to be variable in order to adapt to different PD mode because the intensity as you, you as RF users know, uh, can change if you are if we are in 20 milliamps or if we are in 90 milliamps, on, uh, for example, as in the in the 16 bench, and to run the whole of it synchronous uh, with the DSRF uh, uh, storage ring. Uh, then we have uh, uh, consider uh, we have started to work with the most complicated cases for the synchronization, which is the work with the um, uh, fixed target. And uh, we are developing this in collaboration uh, with the EMBL uh, instrumentation team. So here you see basically an evolution of the MD3 app as it installed on ID232. Uh, and we have uh, here you see one of the chip as, uh, uh, as I show in the, some of the previous slide. So the idea is that this translation uh, occurs synchronous with the external clock, which is the uh, ESRF clock. And I don't know if I can play this. Yes. So you see here, this is a movement of, uh, of this support, uh, which is occurring synchronous to an external clock, which is in this case simulating the uh, ESRF clock. And the whole system is capable uh, or will be capable um, to trigger other devices like uh, laser or their injectors, trigger the detector. And since uh, the diffractometer leaves enough space, uh, it will be also compatible with other sample delivery system. As you see in here, for example, you have an injector, uh, I viscous is the injector uh, mounted. <coughs> uh, so in terms of synchronization, as I mentioned, uh, we plan to be synchronous with the machine. Um, initially we thought that probably that was not necessary because uh, um, a bunch, it takes a little bit less than three, three microseconds to make a whole turn. 
and you will see that uh, the hours uh, and slowest, uh, uh, sh fastest exposure time is a bit longer uh, by that. Uh, but then we thought that uh, if we were fixing everything to the same clock, that's gonna be things much easier. And uh, besides that, it's gonna be uh, ready for the future for um, to make even shorter um, exposure time. So basically we have uh, the clock from the radio frequency and this clock is propagated to the B line and synchronize the fast shopper, the power shopper and the translation of the fixed target as you saw in the previous slide in the, uh, in the animation. And then, well, all these events align, the trigger, so when the, there is a hole in the chip, a trigger is sent to the detector and can be also sent to uh, other devices. Um, so the fast shopper in the design that we are currently working on should be, will be able to do three different exposure time, uh, ranging from 10 to 30 microsecond, while the power shopper, it will be in 100 to 150 uh, microsecond. Uh, of course, the objective of the power shopper is to absorb power. So we are not uh, uh, too much interested in, um, in speed and also it needs to have a certain mass in order to dissipate uh, the heat. So the raising time uh, of, the, of the power shopping opening, it's uh, relatively slow, but let's say that can be used, especially probably the beginning of the commissioning time for, uh, for test. The initial repetition rate at which we are working is slightly less than one kilohertz. Initially, we were aiming at one kilohertz as a magic number. Uh, we are gonna work at 100, 925 hertz. And this is uh, uh, for the reason that this is a, an exact division of the radio frequency. So we're gonna take the radio frequency, take a division on it, and this is gonna be our clock. Uh, in terms of synchronization of the devices, uh, we can uh, basically have quite larger of other um, triggering signal that can be sent out, like for example, in this, uh, in this image here, and that can be fine-tuned in steps of uh, 40 nanoseconds. So this is how the uh, beam line layout um, looks like. Uh, we have an optic edge, which is just being uh, rebuilt uh, in place, more or less with the same size. Uh, the old experimental edge that was very familiar uh, with the user uh, becomes uh, the new optic edge. And then as I said, there is a long B line and the new experimental edges, there will be actually two, two, two experimental edges will be placed in the chartreuse hall where there will be a control cabin and the sample preparation laboratory. Um, so this is a, just a, uh, a layout uh, with the different elements. Let's say that the key component uh, that is gonna be placed in the first optic edge uh, is the monochromator. A lot of things are uh, beam monitor and uh, say, uh, slits, which is taking a lot of place. So the monochromator is based uh, uh, on multi-layer um, mirror, as I said before, and the whole system is gonna be mounted on uh, an exapod, uh, which will permit to uh, tune the energy and change the bandwidth. Uh, I, didn't get to, I didn't go too much in detail, but the bandwidth is gonna be changed by, different, by changing the different coating uh, stripe that will be deposited on the substrate. In the second optic catch, then there will be the chopper. Here we are already in monochromatic uh, uh, beam. So there will be the power chopper here and the fast chopper uh, downstream. Of course, with the appropriate diagnostic to follow the opening and closing of the, uh, of the shot. And then finally, uh, about 50 meters from there, uh, the experimental arch. Uh, well, we have the focusing mirror, which is this KB system, uh, elit elliptically shaped um, KB system. The diffractometers, as I show you, the detector. And then in the, uh, at the bottom, the safety shutter for the second um, experimental, uh, experimental arch. So the idea is that then we can uh, deliver the beam into the experiment, the second arch by uh, moving away the detector from the way and just connecting a pipe. Uh, the whole uh, uh, beam line is gonna be equipped with a very large sample preparation laboratory. Uh, this I think it's very crucial, uh, especially since we're not dealing with it anymore with uh, uh, cryo-cooled uh, crystals. Uh, so a lot of sample, sample preparation uh, will be done uh, on site directly on the B line. 
uh, maybe crystallization itself, uh, and surely preparation of the injector of the 3D devices, uh, loading of the fixed target support, uh, and so on, and a data analysis room. And the whole ambient uh, um, environment between the sample laboratory and the first experimental arch are uh, controlled in humidity and, and temperature to assure that they are stable and they are stable uh, all along the year. Uh, in terms of detector, um, the old uh, photon counting detector or all, even the new photon counting detector are not suitable unfortunately anymore uh, for this kind of experiment because the flux density is really uh, too high. So um, it will not be possible to count all the photons that will hit in a pixel if we were using a uh, photon counting. Um, so we have decided to go for a Jungfrau 4M, which is the development of um, the detector, which is in the development for a uh, Swiss Fell uh, Beeline and the SRF as a collaboration uh, with the Paul Sharing Institute. Um, and uh, we will use a specific detector backend, which has been developed uh, at the SRF. So the Jungfrau is an integrating detector with automatic gain adjusting. Uh, you see basically here, um, as soon as the charge goes up, uh, the detector uh, in each pixel by pixel, uh, the gain is adjusted automatically. So we have uh, um, a very accurate reading of the intensity uh, on each of the pixels. Uh, this of course is very demanding, especially if you are working at uh, one kilohertz because we can have a data output that which has can go up to 16 gigabyte uh, per second. And for this, uh, um, ESRF uh, is developing, the, the ESRF detector group and the software group are developing a, a new uh, library to drive this kind of very fast detector, which is gonna be generic for Jungfrau and for Iger2, for example, uh, PSI detector, uh, which is able to, should be able and will be able to deal with this kind of uh, images. Uh, one uh, caveat that we should bear in mind is that, and this is probably not only related to ID29, uh, maybe not only related to MX, but very common to many other uh, B lines, is that given the uh, efficiency of the uh, with new um, extreme billion source machine, the amount of data that can be collected is going to be uh, huge, and uh, uh, probably data exporting to home for certain techniques uh, is not uh, will not be feasible. Um, so we, we need to think, uh, and we are uh, developing uh, methods, uh, first of all, to select images that are completely blank, uh, for example, so that can be uh, rejected, and uh, to provide remote access for the data reprocessing. So as you've seen, uh, we have intended data analysis room to be next to the beeline. So for example, when uh, the experiment uh, uh, is over and users are working, hanging around to process the data and have support from local staff to the data, they can access uh, that data analysis space. Uh, but still it probably will be necessary to provide them with remote access since the data is gonna be remote access for data analysis since the data are gonna sit uh, at the SRF uh, uh, if the users cannot export and save and store all the data at, um, at home lab. Uh, I didn't say much about uh, uh, the second uh, um, experimental arch. Uh, it's basically intended to be a beeline, uh, a second uh, arch for more, more developmental technique or even more developmental than uh, the first experimental arch. But it's a sort of a prototype in a station. Uh, so where, uh, for example, new sample delivery system or uh, new methodology for serial crystallography can be tested before being uh, finalized and uh, uh, shared with um, shared with the other uh, with the other experimental arch, um, we plan to have a switch between the two B lines uh, quite easily. The advantage of being uh, independent access to ex the second experimental arch is that, for example, uh, a full device can be mounted here while an experiment is running, and when this experiment is over then we can connect and have given the second experimental, uh, second experimental <coughs> uh, So since I cannot show uh, holidays uh, pictures, I'm gonna show you some pictures from uh, the progress of the work. If this webinar were occurring on the SRF, probably we were going uh, around for a visit, uh, but this is uh, not possible. So what I'm gonna show you, it's uh, some photos of the progress of the construction. So, sorry. So 
So by the end of last year, everything was dismantled in the whole experimental hatch and the construction in the new experimental hatch uh, were started. By January, the sample um, preparation lab and the control cabin uh, walls were uh, finished and in place. And the experimental, uh, the two experimental hatch were finalized. Although, as you can see, there is no services, uh, no network, uh, not cable link uh, by then. Uh, then from March, from mid-March, we had, of course, a big stop. And uh, the work have resumed only uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and you see how these are already the progress. This is a picture that I took uh, the other day. Well, some of the services are already connected. There are already the piping for the air treatment uh, system in, in place, which is uh, finalized. And now um, we are finalizing the cabling of um, uh, all the cabling for, for the, uh, the two experimental hatches. From uh, the optic hatch, so the new optic hatch has been uh, mounted uh, very quickly and it's already completed uh, the walls. So the old one was being dismantled. The new one has been put uh, in place. This is uh, finished. And we already have the pipe which is connecting uh, the second optic hatch to uh, the experimental hatch. So this is going from the hole from uh, XPH to the Chartreuse hall. And we have some devices now which are already uh, ready to be delivered since a few time, since a long time, at least a couple of months. But unfortunately, they could not be delivered um, because of the SRF lockdown and the company's lockdown. So this is the Exapod being validated at uh, Symmetry and uh, ready to, to be shipped to, to the SRF. Um, so I'm going I'm um, getting close to my conclusion um, to resume about um, the project of ABS Light 8 in a nutshell. Um, I recall you it's a, it's a serial crystallography beeline designed to do room temperature experiment with a very high flux, high repetition rate, a very short exposure time to be able to, to, to study time resolved, uh, time dependent uh, um, structural changes in the microsecond uh, time range that will be able to adapt different sample environment and crystal delivery system with the space for user to prepare the sample and to analyze data afterwards. And of course, I uh, didn't mention that although some of the example that I show in the introductory part, uh, given the high flux, there'll be a lot of room to study radiation damage effect after the, this high flux. So with that, I like to thank the, well, the whole structural biology group and all the people that are participating into the uh, ABS uh, project. I hope that I did not uh, forget uh, anyone. And I thank you for your, your attention. And I'm happy to take any question. Okay, thank you very much, Daniele, for that excellent talk. And uh, we already have quite a few questions here. Uh, so I'm just, since there doesn't seem to be too much voting, I think I'm just gonna start with the first question from uh, David Aragao, which is, have the MX beamlines at the ESRF moved to uh, web-based MX cube three? Um, so yes, all of them. Mm, and we, we actually in these days uh, commissioning it. And in uh, August, uh, when we restart in user mode, uh, they will be only MX cube three. So only the web version. Okay, uh, second question. Uh, by Fupin is, uh, what is the resolution limit of MX at ESRF and how low the temperature could reach? I'm not sure I... I, I think he's uh, maybe, it's a little bit hard to answer. It, it really depends on the energy that you're at, um, mm -mm -mm. what kind of detector, how big the detector. Uh, and uh, as far as the temperature, um, well, that was yeah. anything. Yeah, in terms of resolution, if, in, if you mean um, resolution, uh, uh, so angle of diffraction, uh, in terms of resolution, we can go up down to 0 0.6 uh, angstrom if we move at high energy on a pillar to 6M. And in terms of temperature, uh, we have uh, the cryo, oh, it's called the octal cryo system. So usually they, they work at under Kelvin, but I know that the sample environment group uh, has also a helium jet that can be used to do to descend at a lower temperature. And I hope that that answered the question. Yeah, I think so. Um, 
So uh, there's another question from uh, David, which is uh, how many meters away is the EH1 hutch from the OH2 hutch? Uh, so it's uh, uh, it's about 40 meters. Okay. And uh, an, an anonymous question, which is uh, what about estimation of energy consumption of the beam line? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we are not that far, yes. Yeah. Well, I think it'll be quite small compared to the energy consumption of the, the ring itself. Uh, another from uh, David, which is a technical question about uh, mounting the mono on, is, is mounting the mono on a hexapod not a high risk? I'm not sure what the risk. Uh, uh, if it's in term of stability. I mean, we have we made all the um, testing and validation before going in that direction. Um, Nevertheless, uh, we have some uh, additional uh, fail-safe solution, uh, especially for the rotation. So for the energy changes, uh, we have some additional, I don't know how what's the English name is. In French, they call it camembert, uh, which is some rotation system based on flexor. So if the resolution of the hexapod is not enough, uh, we have that as a fail-safe solution. But from the tests that uh, were done uh, with charge, uh, the solution should be sufficient. Okay. Uh, so next we have a question from uh, one of our VMLAN scientist uh, colleagues, uh, Michele Cianci, which is, uh, what will be the final demagnification for EBSL8, i.e. which is the, or what is the beam divergence, and uh, will we provide a parallel beam? Um, so we will be, uh, so the divergence, as you see, it's quite uh, large compared to uh, conventional uh, to other B MXB lines, exactly because the magnification is, uh, if I'm right, is still uh, 10 to one uh, from the source size to the beam size. Um, uh, so we could provide the lower, uh, um, lower, lower divergence by slitting uh, the source, uh, by slitting the beam at the source size. Uh, but of course that uh, came, will come at the price of flux. So in terms of optimizing uh, the mono performance, the chopper performance, we were optimizing everything for the full beam because that would, uh, is providing the more challenge in terms of uh, uh, heating and, uh, and dissipation. Of course, we can, uh, we, as I said, we can still collimate the beam. Okay, uh, now we have a, um, an actual user question from uh, Jan Lo, which is uh, what conformational transitions in the microsecond time scale will be investigated first? <laughs> well, I think that will be mainly uh, depends on the user, uh, on the user interest, yeah. Yeah, um, and uh, this is gonna be a hard one to pronounce for me. Uh, Madhuranayaki Thula Singham asks, uh, may I know the possibility of in situ data collection using LCP glass plates? Uh, you mean in general or uh, on a different oh. line? Well, I, I think in, in any case, uh, I'm not sure what are, what you mean by the LCP glass plates because I know. Uh, you could be talking methods, about Caffrey's. But I think we can, we can uh, yeah, it's something that can be doable, yes. Yeah, and we've, uh, I think we've already collected on some of those, so it should definitely yes. be for you. Especially if they can be mounted on the spine standard on the magnetic cap. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that we've done already. Um, now we have uh, another question from an Australian colleague from uh, Tom. Yeah, Car Hello, uh, Tom. Which is uh, is the DMM water or LN uh, or liquid nitrogen cold? Water, water. Okay. Um, next question is from Judith uh, Juan Hui Giver. Uh, what is the resolution and accuracy you need in the KV mirrors to modify the beam size and have the beam back at the same place? Uh, terrific, yes. Um, I can't remember by heart, but I think it was uh, less than a milli degree. It was something like, uh, I can't remember if it was a 10 or 100 micro, micro degree. Uh, so that, uh, in fact, we have, um, so the pusher to do that, it's a very complex uh, piezo system uh, to, to tune that, yes. Okay. 
Um, I guess a, another way that you could think about doing it is just slitting down and eliminating a smaller part of the mirror, but of course you then you give up flux. Mm -hmm. okay, another question from Tom, uh, which is, how are you rejecting low energy from the DMM? Are you using filters? Um, no, so for the for the coating, uh, we should not get uh, lower um, lower harmonic to that. No, I think it's um, it's already reject the mirror with the double bunching has already reject that. Okay, so the mirror, yeah, for the mirror will uh, will provide the harmonic rejection. Yeah. Okay, another one from Judith. Um, Even though the Bragg angle of the multi layer is low, thermal conditions on the DMM will change upon energy uh, with undulator gap changes. How do you correct the beam accordingly? I'm not sure what you mean um, by correcting. Uh, I would assume it's uh, this position. Uh, I'm not sure though. Um, yeah, if it's position, um, so we have two two ways: the tiny rotation on the second mirror, and there is a tiny compensation on the other diffract meter uh, level. Yeah. Okay. Uh, then from a colleague, another beamline scientist colleague um, in Sweden, um, Tom. Uh, he uh, says, "Great talk, Daniel." And what is the what is defining the zero point three percent bandwidth? Uh, is it the undulator peak? No, it's a it's a different coating. So uh, the multi-layer substrate uh, will have uh, exactly three different uh, multi-layer coating, and uh, one optimized for one percent bandwidth, and the other one for three percent bandwidth. Yeah. Okay, so it's just a function of the multi-layer itself. Um, and uh, final question, I think we have time for this last one, which is, uh, what will be your strategy for time resolved studies of enzymes? Um, it says in parentheses, sort of stop flow implementation, not using photo activation. So I guess uh, actual mixing experiments. Mm, well, I would say that it really depends on the type uh, of sample delivery system that is being used. Uh, clearly, microfluidic uh, could be a way to start um, because that's easier to implement. Uh, but I'm looking with very much interested on this all this injector with P junction and uh, yeah. I would assume it would depend a lot on the time scale also. That yep. you're oh, one last question here. Um, any plans for using the Hadamard transform? Yes. Okay. Okay, great. Um, and um, I think with that, we can wrap things up. Okay, okay. so. Um, uh, thank you for everyone, uh, to, for, to everyone for attending, and uh, thank you again, Daniele, um, and uh, look forward to the next seminar in the series.